Well, good morning, and everybody. My name is Mike at Filmboy24, and just when you thought that these videos couldn't get any better, we go and we do something like this. Well, we don't. We're just going to review this Yashica, kind of break it down and and stuff. So maybe maybe not better, but stay tuned. Well, like I so eloquently informed you in that ridiculous intro, <laughs> we are going to take a peek at a an interesting Super 8 film camera. Uh, I'm going to break this camera down. I'm going to do it relatively quickly because it's a simple camera. So if you have one of these Yashica 600 Super Electro cameras, you may want to, uh, you know, tune in. Or if you're thinking about getting one, we're going we're gonna to go over it. We're also going to take a peek at something I did with this camera. Because, you know, I can't break down or review a camera without shooting a roll or two of film through it. Through it. So I did just that. And I used this. I'm pointing a lot. But I used this. And we tried to sync up some audio, some yakking from me to this, with this. Anyway, I'm going to show you that in a couple of minutes. On to the ding, ding, ding main event. <laughs> this is the Super 600, uh, Yashica rather, Super 600 Electro Super 8 Silent Movie Camera. Uh, this camera came out a long time ago, 70s. And this particular example here in my hand was sent to me by a subscriber. He also sent me a, I believe it was the Sankyo EM40 that we did a review on some time ago. Uh, this is his camera. He was gracious enough to send it to me. Let me, you know, put it through the paces that I like to put them through, shoot some film through it, get used to it, get cozy and comfy with it. No, I didn't do that with it. Um, <laughs> and, and sort of just, uh, you know, overview it. Give it some of my pros and cons and do a breakdown and a review. So I will tell you this. Thank you, Jake, for sending it in. I'll get it back to you in one piece, hopefully. It is a very robust and very heavy camera for a Super 8, sort of a just grab and go camera. This camera comes in at just a tick over three pounds. That's about 50 ounces in that range or about 1400 grams. So it's not a lightweight camera. It is an all metal bodied construction. Everything on this camera that I can see is metal, except for the leatherette around the, the, the handle here. There are some things I like about this camera. There are some things I don't like about this camera. We'll get into that, the pros and cons at the end. But let me tell you, it operates on, and I'll give you close-ups uh, where applicable. It operates simply on four AA batteries that go right here inside the handle. When I got this camera from Jake, and actually from when he got it, the batteries were the all too uh, familiar corroded batteries. You know, if, when you buy cameras, it's hit and miss. You never know if there's gonna be batteries that are corroded inside. They were a bit corroded in this one. He cleaned it, got it to run, sent it to me. It needed a tick more cleaning to get it to run again, which I did, and now, she purrs like a kitten. It boasts a beautiful six to one zoom lens. This is a Yashinon eight to 48 millimeter F 1.8 zoom lens, which is a six to one because eight times six is 48. This particular camera does have a UV filter screwed onto the front of the lens. If you don't use a UV filter on your Super 8 cameras or on any of your cameras, you probably should, if for no other reason, it just protects the glass on your camera. This camera has the ability to properly meter film at ASA ranges from 25 up to 400 ASA, or now we call it ISO. When they made this camera, they called it ASA. It has sort of a funky little, little shroud here in the front. It's a kind of a, a, a cover, which is probably Probably a good thing. It protects the, the little staircase meter system inside the camera. I'll give you a close-up of that so you can see what I'm talking about. But once you pop the cartridge in, the camera automatically knows what your, your camera's speed 
should be set at and does so automatically. So that's a nice feature of this little camera. A lot of them do that, but a lot of them only go from 25 or 40 up to about 160. This one has a much wider range. Now it does boast filming speeds of 12, 18, and 24 frames per second, which I like a lot. You guys know I always film typically in 24 frames per second. It also will use a cable release and give you the ability to shoot one frame at a time for animation and things like that. Now I don't have a cable release up here, one of those cable things, but give me one second and I will get it. I'll be right back. And there we have it, right there. Now this is a tiny one. This is only about 10, 12 inches long. These are made, uh, were made up to about a meter or about 40 inches in length, which is quite handy. Now on the side of the camera here where the film compartment is, there's two cable release sockets and they're just little female threads here. And on the end of your cable release is also, a, there's a male thread. Now for your single frame, which is the top one, it has a little tiny one kind of etched into the metal. You would screw this into the side, boom, boom, boom. Now with your camera on the N over here, which we'll get to this in one second, you simply, and it, as you push this, it clicks off one frame at a time. So that's for animation or if you just wanna take photos with this camera, which is quite handy. Now, if you want to continuous run, with a cable release, you would put it in the next slot down here in the bottom, the next little thread, screw it in, and then there's a little plunger on the end of this, and you push it in, and your camera continuously runs at whatever speed you have it set on over here. Now, this is a little bit different than the remote socket, which we're going to get to in one second. This plunger, and most plungers will have a... a little dial here on the side or some way to keep the plunger down. So if we push it down and we twist this side piece here, we can let go and the camera is going to continuously run, which is kind of neat. Very similar to the run lock, but this allows you to do it with a little bit, a little bit more remote ability. You just unscrew and it pops the plunger back up, unscrew it from the side here. Good to go. Now, like I mentioned a minute ago, it also has a remote socket over here on the other side. So what's the difference? Well, this is what I like to call mechanical remotes, which is by use of, you know, inertia or physical force. And this is your electrical remote and it does operate a little bit differently. Now I don't, I have some remotes, some electric remotes, but I don't have one with, that has the right uh, pin size here which that's an eighth inch socket, I believe. So you simply plug that in and then with your remote, what you do is you have your remote off and you want to turn this onto run lock. So right here, this, there's a little dial right here by your, your trigger or your release that has an L, an N and an RL on it. L is lock. Now, not only does it lock and give you the inability to fire the camera, but it also shuts the camera down so you're not draining your batteries. If you go to N, which is normal, it just functions normally. Whatever framing or whatever filming speeds you're on, everything is, whoop, where's my filming speeds? Oh, there they are. Everything operates normal. Now, if you click it over to RL, that's run lock. So as soon as you depress this trigger or the shutter release and let go, your camera is going to just continuously run until you flip this dial back to N and that releases your trigger here. Now what you want to do with your remote is you plug the remote into this socket here, but first you want to have this on run lock, plug in the remote, and then you trigger the remote and as you trigger and untrigger it turns your camera off and on electronically. So this is an electronic feature to turn it off and on this is your, we'll call it, what do I call it? Mechanical feature to plunger it off and on. Um, they work very similarly, literally, uh, but you usually can have much more range with these. I have some remotes that, I mean, I've got 10, 12 feet of cable. This camera doesn't have manual exposure. The closest thing that it's going to give you 
is right here on the side of the camera is your brightness control. And like I say, I'll give you close-ups when I can. And what this dial does is it allows for three different settings. It's not manual exposure, but it's as close as you can get without having manual exposure or electronic exposure lock. You have spotlight, you have normal, and you have backlight. Now, most of us are pretty familiar with backlight. We all should be familiar with normal. Spotlight is the opposite of backlight. So if you want to stop your camera up or close down your iris on your lens and let less light in, you settle down, you want it on spotlight. And that's this out, outer dial it, it uh, on the outside of your frames per second dial, you put it on spotlight and you're gonna, you're gonna decrease your stop by about one. If you wanna shoot normal, right in the middle, and now you're shooting your film at box speed. If you wanna add a stop or open your aperture up one, you will put it on backlight. Now, when you're shooting film that is long beyond its process before date, which is what I did in this case right here, I just leave the camera on backlight. I'm not going to say that I suggest always leaving it on backlight, but if this was my camera, I probably would, no matter what film I'm shooting. Now, I process all my own film here at the house, and it's always a negative, even if it's a reversal film. So this helps me a lot when it comes to that. So that's what that dial does there. Right next to it, you have what most all cameras have, and that's just your footage counter, and this one is in a dial form. So as your film runs down, the little dial goes around, kind of around the clock here, down to 50. Right next to that, you have, oh, and this little window here just lets you know that your camera is running or the film is running. As you depress, you'll see a blue, you'll see a blue and a white sort of tin that, that goes by. Boom, boom, boom. That just kind of lets you know that everything is running properly. Oh, we're on run lock. Right next to that, you have, on the bottom here, you have your battery check. Your four AA batteries in the bottom here. You depress this little red button, and if this green light lights up nice and bright, your batteries are good. Let's give it a shot, see if you can see it. Bing! Bing! I don't know if you can see that, but it's lighting up nice and bright. Right above that is your diopt adjust or your diopter adjuster dial. Now what that is is for people like me that wear glasses, I can't see super close up, but I can see relatively good far away. So I have to turn this dial. It's, it's a lot easier to look through a viewfinder of a camera without glasses on. So, but in order to do that, you wanna try to make or match this viewfinder to your glasses. Uh, it's kind of like wearing reading glasses. This gives you the strength of your reading glasses as you turn this dial. For me, I pretty much have to turn it all the way to the right. And the way to set this properly is to set your focus on infinity, zoom all the way in to something that is an infinite distance away or 50 or 60 feet, and then look through and then turn your diopt adjust until it's in focus. That's essentially how you adjust the diopter. You want to be able to see the, the grain on the focusing screen is what you're looking to do. The zoom on this camera, top electronic zoom only. Wide, not wide. Boom, boom. I have my glasses on. Zoom in, zoom out. That's the only way you can zoom on this camera. There is no manual zoom lever on the lens itself. Now inside, when you look through the viewfinder, you get a little bit of information in the viewfinder screen. At the very top, there's a little half moon where you have your f-stops that are automatically set in the camera. Uh, and you can see what your f-stops are. If you go too far one way or the other, if you, if you need more light or you need less light, it's going to max out and you're going to see that. You're going to see the end of the scale and then you'll see a sun or a light bulb and that's going to tell you you need more or less light. If you're on one end or the other of the spectrum, you're going to know whether you need more or less light. When you get to the end of a roll of film or when you have no film in the camera and you look through the viewfinder and you're pulling the shutter release trigger, 
end. The word end in the bottom right corner of the viewfinder will shine brightly in red, beautiful red block letters to let you know you have ended your day with that roll of film. Now the focus on this is the round, center round micro prism. It isn't the split image uh, that I always like to see. It's the micro prism. So when you're looking through and you see your subject, you want to focus the camera right here on the lens until everything is nice and sharp in the center of that little micro prism. The very top of the camera, the only way to disengage the 85 filter that's inside, built in behind the lens of this camera and in front of the film, is by putting the movie light into this movie light slot on the top of the camera. The only other thing you can do is use a filter key that I believe did come with these cameras. I don't have the one for this one, but it's a little thin piece of metal with a ring in it and you push it down in there and it just moves that 85 filter out of the way. Um, there is no provision to turn the filter off. You know, the sun and the light bulb that's in a lot, on a lot of cameras. That does, this doesn't have that. So to turn the filter off or disengage that filter, you need to get a filter key and jam it down into that slot right there. And that's pretty much it. That's the basics of this camera. It has a hand strap and it has a quarter 20 tripod uh, socket right here on the bottom. So now that we got through the camera, let me tell you quickly what I did with it to put it through its paces. Well, I tried to get cute with it at first, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, and if you watched my, my last live stream, you saw the footage I shot with this camera. But I tried to get cute and I used Kodachrome film. I thought it would be kind of fun to run a pack of Kodachrome through this that uh, had, a, had a process before date of 2000, which I thought with just using the backlight and opening up one stop that we'd get good results, but we didn't. It came out really poorly. So I'm not showing you that particular role. If you want to see that, go back and look at my live stream from a couple days ago. But what I did decide to do was put this particular roll through the camera. Now this roll was really, really rough. I can't remember where I got this. It probably came with another batch of, of film somewhere that I got maybe online or something. Uh, but I've had it for a while and I've kept it stored in my air conditioned home. The box was in really poor condition. It looked like it had water damage to it. Luckily, the film was still sealed inside the box. And as we all know, this film is sealed inside a kind of a uh, mylar-ish type bag. So moisture really, I don't think, got to it. So I decided to use this old roll of Vision 2 200T in this camera, but I wanted to go one step further and I shot it at 24 frames per second. I did use the backlight feature like I just discussed, but I wanted to try to see if I could sync sound to a camera that I had never really shot before, aside from that old roll of Kodachrome. So I busted out my trusty DR, my Tascam DR05X. This is an excellent little digital audio recorder, by the way. If you're interested in one, check the description. I'll put a link for it down below. <laughs> you like that ad? I use this, uh, this little Boya clip-on microphone that I, that I use for all of my videos, and I attached it to the Tascam. And then I went out into my backyard, hooked this bad boy up right here to my tripod, and I filmed me talking into this microphone, which was into this recorder, using this film. And then I finished it up. Uh, I marked the front and the, the, the head and the tail slate and took it in there and edited it up and tried to marry the audio. And you're going to see in a second whether or not I was able to sync this audio to this film with this camera. Let me tell you that the camera did run slow. I ran it at 24 frames per second. My guess is that it was actually running somewhere around 22 frames per second because when I played it back, I, I scanned it and played it back, I was sort of uh, a little bit Keystone Cops. You know, I was moving a little fast when I was slating and things like that. I don't move a lot when I'm talking out there, but, but so, so what I had to do in post is instead of stretching or compressing the audio, which would have made me sound like this, I decided I would stretch the video or film file a little bit to get me back up to about 24 frames per second. 
I don't typically like to stretch the film file itself. I like to mess with the audio a little more. But in this case, since the camera did run pretty slow, I decided to stretch the film file. Now, what do we get? Keep in mind, I shoot, process, scan, and deliver all the film myself. Yep, processed it all myself. This film was uh, manufactured in 2008, this particular roll, so 15-year-old film. Keep all of that in mind, and here's what I got. Well, like that uh, devilishly handsome fella in the, uh, in the studio said earlier, we're testing out the Yashica Super 600 Electro that was sent to me by a subscriber. Um, I'm trying to keep a little bit of track of my time. Uh, I've always liked to experiment with syncing sound with these non-crystal sync cameras, this being one of them. Uh, if you remember back, I was able to sync some sound with a wind-up Super 8 camera, which was pretty interesting. So we're going to see how well it does right here. Now, I am using this quite old Vision 2 200T stock, so I have no idea how it's going to come out. Uh, I am overexposing this by a stop, and like I likely said earlier, uh, my camera, or this camera, Jake's camera, is going to overexpose it a tiny bit anyway because it's reading this this 200t as if it were one of the old 160 asa or iso uh, cartridges film cartridges so it's a tiny bit cloudy out here today not a lot it's a, it's a beautiful day here for uh, the central florida area but like i said earlier i want to try and see if we can hopefully sync up the sound. I am filming this at 24 frames per second um, and I have no idea just how lovely this footage will come out because I don't know how this particular roll of film was stored. I have a bad feeling about this particular roll because the box is in really bad condition. Um, hopefully it's going to come out better than Kodachrome. Really? Uh, hopefully it comes out better than Kodachrome. Uh, most everything comes out better than Kodachrome. Um, so that's about it. I just wanted to give it a quick run through. Uh, what better thing to film than this? Yeah, lots of better things, I know. Um, we're at a couple of minutes now, so we're gonna wrap it up and we're gonna take it back to the aforementioned ridiculously handsome fellow in the studio right now. Back to you, Mike synced up pretty darn good, if you ask me. I, I mean, and, and the, the quality, it's hit and miss. There's, a, there's, some, uh, there's some issues. There's a bit of deterioration. There's a little bit of fog. There's some, you know, probably, probably more dust and scratches than normal. But like I said earlier, this is what I do for fun. It, it's, this is my golf game. I like to shoot film, and I like to process it myself, and I scan everything myself on my movie stuff, retro scan. Uh, scanners. It's This is my enjoyment. So I, I'm really happy with the results. Um, I think this camera did a pretty darn good job. My focus was maybe out just a tad. Keep in mind, I do all of this myself. I did not have my wife or my kids out there to sit in while I focused and fine focused. I had to, you know, kind of do it. I think I actually had a tape measure up on the chair and then I focused in on the tape measure or something like that. So, and then I actually measured for distance as well. I got it pretty close, not terrible. Overall, I'm very happy with the results. If you were thinking about picking one of these, th these little cameras up, make sure that there's no corrosion in the battery compartment. Uh, if there is, make sure it's not too heavy and that it's, it's, it's able to be cleaned out. Let that be a lesson to all of you who may or may not consider leaving batteries in your camera. If you don't think you're gonna use your camera, even for a couple days, Take the batteries out. I mean, you're, you're going to thank me later, I promise you, because I still find things occasionally, remote controls for my TVs and stuff that have batteries in them. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this little demonstration, this little breakdown, this review. If you did, there's one particular way that you can show me very, very quickly. Yep, tap that little thumbs up button. I would greatly appreciate it. And if you truly think I've earned it, how about do me a favor and subscribe? Hit the bell. Hit the bell. Boom, boom. 
so that you know each and every time that I post a brand spanking new video. I also live stream every Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. If you like goofy little film topics and then general film chat for about an hour, we have a fun little core group of film people that get involved every Sunday. I'd love to see you join us. We do it right here. Got my computer set up. It's a lot of fun, and I look forward to it every Sunday. Um, sometimes I'm one to two minutes late because I'm brewing a fresh cup of coffee, but I'm always there on Sundays. Uh, I do have a found film series. Uh, we just did film number 50 of that series, and I can tell you right now, I also have film number 51 ready to go. It was processed. I have that video ready to go. That'll be up after this one, and it's 16 millimeter film, so look out for that. You might want to subscribe just for that, if nothing else, if not for that. And until the very next time that I see all of your stunning faces, that means you as well. Uh-huh. There it is. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That was a go-around. I'll see all of you on the very, very next go-around.